still take a little bit time. Okay. I see Anthony pop up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another, another familiar face. And we have Wasif also, who is originally from Azerbaijan, but he is living in USA. Hi, uh, hi Anthony. Anthony uh, greets you, Brian. Oh, there you go. Okay, great. And okay. Okay. Now, uh, okay, I, I know that uh, we will get uh, 30 people, I hope. If you don't mind, let's wait for two or three minutes. Sure. Again. Yeah, great. Okay. So, uh, so let's get started, uh, Brian. So let me share my screen. I hope you see my screen, right? Yep. Yeah, great. So uh, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, greeting you by Baku time, where the time is evening time. Welcome to Baku Power BI, Excel, and Innovative Educators Meetup Group's 13th session in 2022. Uh, let's go on with our agenda. Uh, after introduction part of our session, uh, I, will go, I will give you some information about our sponsor, so-called Enterprise DNA. And then uh, we will define our winners based on the list of uh, participants for the previous two sessions. And then uh, today's speaker, Mr. Brian Julius, uh, will uh, speak about effectively employing tax patterns. And at the end, we will have Q&A session. So uh, Baku Power BI, Excel, and Innovative Educators Meetup Group uh, has roughly 1,300 uh, numbers, uh, I mean members, 50% of which is coming from Azerbaijan. And uh, Baku Power BI Meetup Group is sponsored by Enterprise DNA. Enterprise DNA uh, gives three uh, free, free annual membership each month. Uh, and Enterprise DNA is uh, an Australian educational platform. Uh, it's a great platform. Uh, and people who wants to be data analyst, who wants to get the latest information about Microsoft Power Platform products is the place that where uh, that people, those people can get. There are a lot of information related to Power BI, Power Apps, Power Map, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Power Automate, and also our language, Python, SharePoint, so on and so forth. And as for today's speaker, uh, our today's speaker is Brian uh, Julius, uh, who is coming from USA and who is a chief content creator in Enterprise DNA. I hope in next minutes he will give uh, the necessary information uh, about himself. I would like to introduce, uh, and he's going to talk about effectively employing tax patterns today. As for next speaker, um, we uh, are going to hosting uh, going to host Alejandra Horwat from Can uh, Can Canada, and uh, who is going to talk about connecting reports in Excel. And uh, I think uh, now uh, uh, what I would like to tell you is that uh, our session is recorded and live with streaming. Uh, it's happening on uh, Facebook, so-called Excel World uh, Facebook page. And uh, also you have an opportunity to watch a recorded version of each session on my YouTube channel. Uh, so if you uh, look for Ilgar Zarbaliev in Parents' Excel World, you will find his YouTube channel and you will have an opportunity to watch all the recorded uh, versions of my Meetup sessions. So uh, I would like to uh, also give uh, some information about My Data Summit. Uh, my Data Summit is a three-day event which is going to happen uh, for the period of uh, 5th to 7th September of current year. Uh, it will be held on a so-called uh, Endless Fairs uh, virtual platform. And uh, 35 speakers will be delivering 
valuable sessions and Brian Julius is also delivering a speech session in this event and we are very happy to host him also. So this is the great um, uh, lineup of our speakers. You can find very familiar, very uh, expert uh, people who are expert in data uh, field. So uh, I hope now it's time uh, to define our winners. So I will, it will take only just two minutes. Let me switch to my Excel file with the permission. So uh, here uh, I have all the names of uh, people who attended uh, the last previous two sessions, right? And uh, so here we can see uh, briefly the names and uh, duration overall. So uh, I selected people who attended more than 40 minutes, right? So let's go on with the row list. Here we can find uh, overall uh, 58 people. This is the number of the people who are eligible for a selection process. And here I have, I'm just going to use index and also rank between Excel functions. It's very possible that uh, one name can be appeared for two times. If this happens, I will uh, select uh, winners once again. So what I'm just going to do, I'm just going to press on F9, right? And I will uh, count back from three to one, and then uh, I will raise my fingers. So three, two, and one. So these are the people, Ali Sayed, Mark Pochard, yeah, I hope I pronounce it correctly, and Bill, uh, these are uh, people, uh, our, uh, our winners uh, for August. Uh, I mean, uh, so after this uh, meetup session, I will contact with these people. So I will kindly ask their email address uh, to introduce to Enterprise DNA and they will have the necessary access to Enterprise DNA platform. So um, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, joining today's session. And I strongly believe that uh, we are going to meet on September 13th, 2022. So now it's time. So I would like to uh, now uh, to deliver the stage to Brian Julius. So I'm just going to start sharing. So Brian, stage is yours. Okay, let me just get my, my screen share set up. And... see. Now, can you all see that? All right. Yes. Yes. You see. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to present to you today. And, um, you know, very much appreciate folks taking a Friday, a weekend Friday night um, to, uh, to be here. So this is, um, this is a topic I find really fascinating. And when I talked to Ilgar, when he originally invited me and um, we talked about topics. This was one he suggested. And I really like it because it it really, if, if Dickens wrote about this, he would say DAX patterns are, are really the best of tools and the worst of tools in the sense that you can, you can do some amazing things with DAX patterns and they can be a, a tremendous time saver and a huge help in, in learning. They also can cause enormous problems and really put you on a bad path. And so um, it's it's something I have a little hesitancy about because um, it's got some real downsides if, if, if you're not careful. And I wanna show you, even if you are careful, some of the pitfalls that using using patterns from different sources can can result in. But there's also a lot of plus. So I, I, think, I think it's interesting and I, I very much look forward to a, an interesting discussion on this one. Um, feel free to jump in at any point. You know, ask questions, make comments. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always eager to um, to have that sort of feedback and interchange. Um, so, just a little bit about me. Um, you know, I describe myself as a, a lifelong data geek. I remember, um, you know, being seven years old and keeping notebooks of football statistics and. Um, you know, kind of everything I've done, you know, really since that time has been somehow related to to data. And I just kind of see the world and think about the world through data. Um, this this 
picture here was something that um, last week, um, Chris Wagner, who's a Microsoft MVP and just a fun guy and does some really interesting stuff on his site, um, tagged me as uh, one of his first two data Spartans. And so as part of that, I got I got this this drawing and I thought it was kind of a fun way to put a profile pic on the uh, on the site. So my background is is economics um, and public policy, but with a real quantitative econometric concentration. And um, you know I started my career um, in economic consulting and litigation support, doing a lot of a lot of econometric work, a lot of um, what we would now call data science. Um, you know back then the, that that term didn't exist. so, you know, it, it was just kind of, you know, data analysis or litigation support. Um, and then I spent 31 years um, after after a relatively brief stint in consulting, moved over to the government to actually my main client, who as when I was a consultant, um, to do economic analysis and data analysis for um, an agency called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And one of NOAA's missions is to recover damages on behalf of the public for things like oil spills and hazardous waste sites. And so, you know, for those of you who remember the the huge Deepwater Horizon spill um, back about ten years ago, you know that was that was one that we led the the science and the data collection effort, and um, you know really led the the settlement efforts and the efforts to restore the resources. And so that was that was what I did for about thirty years. And then just over the last two years, um, have been working directly with Enterprise DNA as their chief content officer. So responsible for overseeing our content operations and basically interacting with experts all over the world. Um, you know, that's one of the best parts of the job is, um, you know, to, to meet with and talk with and get to know um, experts in Power BI and Power Platform and Python and R and Deneb and um, you know all the different tools that we that we cover and Ilgar is is, is actually one that um, you know it was through that through that work that he and I got connected and he's actually got a great course coming out um, at the end of this month on um, the PL three hundred certification and. Um, you know, so it's it's folks like him and others around the world that um, you know really get to interact with and kind of work to build the content that you know helps people achieve their their goals in in data analysis and data science. Um, so it's something I love. Um, you know, it's it's just constantly changing. We're constantly adding and innovating. Um, so personally, I live in Washington D.C. I have for the last. 33 years um, with my my wife Sue and um, as I say my two what I what I call my supervisory team here, which is my two very poorly behaved cats who may make an appearance um, during this this presentation. They frequently do during my YouTube videos. And um, as I say, I really just enjoy the the interactions with the global data community. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, love creating content. You know have regular um, additions to the YouTube channel on Enterprise DNA and um, as well as, you know, podcasts and, and other content. So um, that's that's a bit about me. Um, but let's let's really jump in and talk about DAX patterns. And when we talk about what what are DAX patterns, it's general reusable DAX solutions to commonly occurring problems. So it's it's the type of things that you see pop up all the time in your reports in your analyses. And so um, some of those, those common patterns are um, cumulative totals, moving averages, previous value is one that we see all the time. And there's, there's a whole series of really common analyses that lend themselves to DAX patterns, um, partially because some of, these, some of these are quite complex um, in terms of the actual DAX. And so, a DAX pattern lets you lets you kind of jump into that that analysis and kind of get a head start on that on that that more complex DAX. 
Um, but in doing so, there are there are some real benefits and some huge, huge risks. And um, the potential benefits are are speed. You know, obviously, if you've got a a detailed complex measure and somebody has already done the the legwork on that to build that out, um, that is that's a huge step forward that you potentially don't have to spend that time on. Um, ease of use. Um, so you know they've already got the measure, you know, set up in in a, you know in cases. Um, you know where the the measure has been done with a lot of care. You know there's prior validation. There's there's the quality control in that. So you know that's stuff that um, when you're building those out yourself, that all takes a lot of time. And so the ability to short circuit that and um, and take advantage of that work that somebody else has already been done. Huge potential benefit. But with that comes a lot of risk. And you know the risk can be that that the the measure or the um, you know the the pattern that they have developed is not a perfect match to your situation, and in some cases that's fine. You know that you can you can modify the pattern, and the pattern really in most cases is just a starting point. And so it it's not expected in many cases that it's going to be a perfect match right away. That you're going to potentially have to work that to make it to make it align with your your use case. Um, another real potential risk is unrecognized edge conditions that you really have to be careful in using DAX patterns that you're testing the extremes and the unusual cases in that pattern because patterns that look like they're giving you the answer in kind of the the common data kind of in the center of your data set um, may be deceptive in that they may not be performing across the spectrum in exactly the way you think. And I'm gonna show you some very simple measures, um, you know, some very simple patterns that have this edge condition problem. And so, you know, something definitely look out for, something that even in, in ones that I've done and spent a lot of time working on, I've had this come up and and others, there was a, a really interesting case of, a couple of months ago of one that I started a pattern on from a Venn diagram um, DAX analysis. And somebody on LinkedIn, you know, very correctly pointed out, I'd failed to take into account, you know, the edge condition. Um, the last thing is, you know, the opportunity for learning. And I think when you build a a complex DAX pattern up from scratch. For me, at least, there's a huge amount of learning that, that goes into that. And if you're basically short-circuiting the process and, um, and jumping in kind of toward the end, you may lose that, um, you may lose that opportunity. And I see Anthony has a comment here, may not fit your data model as well. And that is absolutely right that, um, you know, Depending on, you know, if somebody is building out a, a, a pattern on a star schema and you've got a snowflake, um, or if you, you know, and this is not something I ever recommend doing, but if you're working, say, without a dates table and you're relying on the auto date time, um, that may not match well at all with, um, with the pattern. So definitely something to be careful of. And the the danger sign here is, and there's there's a great quote, and I wish I knew, I wish I knew who who said it. Um, I, I hope one day to to say it, and somebody say, "Oh yeah, that's mine." Um, but what they said is, is they said, "Obvious errors are embarrassing; subtle errors get you fired." And I think that is that is one of the things that really makes me wary of of DAX patterns in terms of that it's very easy to create numbers that look right and are subtly wrong. And so that that's definitely something that as we go through, I, I really want to keep keep in mind. And the um the thing to think about is when you're 
when you're using a DAX pattern, what you're really doing is you're, you're really borrowing your neighbor's tools. And I think it's important to kind of make sure you're borrowing the right type of tools. Um, and when I, when I say that, there are some wildly complex DAX patterns. And, um, you know, for those of you who, um, I don't know, is my, I can't tell, is my camera still on in the, um, in the corner? No, uh, we don't. Okay, see so you only see my screen. So yeah, I'm holding yeah, up yeah. a book. I'm holding up a book, but you can't see it. But basically, if you have, if any of you have the um, the SQL BI DAX patterns book, you know there are some very very complicated patterns in there. Um, similarly, one of my favorite books is Greg Deckler's DAX Cookbook, which is a, a slightly different take on the, the DAX patterns, but some very complex ones in there as well, and. I think what, what I always try to do is make sure that the patterns I'm borrowing are consistent with the level of knowledge I've got, because I think you can really, you can really get into trouble kind of borrowing above your knowledge level. And that's to, to say, um, that's to say that even the, even the relatively simple ones um, come with some, with some risks. Um, and Anthony has, yeah, to be very careful with, with some of Greg's patterns. And I think that's true for, you know, I would say that for the SQL BI patterns and for all the patterns I'm going to show you. Um, and Bill has a, a yeah, for, that I definitely will put the, um, the book titles in the chat. Um, so this is, this is a hundred percent true story. And this is really in a sense, kind of how a decision on DAX patterns changed my career. Um, and so when I was at the tail end of my career with NOAA, I had moved into, I was originally, you know, for a long time, I had been doing, kind of moved out of the hands-on data work and had been doing, you know, senior management, um, supervision of different teams, teams of economists, teams of business analysts, teams of spatial analysts. Um, and I really got to the point where I wanted to get back into the hands-on data analysis. And oh, Anthony, thank you for for putting the uh, the uh, citations in the chat. And so I, I basically stepped away from the management role and got back into into analysis. And it was coming at a time when we were just getting into um, Power Platform and Power BI, and I had never never worked with Power BI before. I had not even heard of it before I started on that project. And this was this was early 2019. And I started on a, um, a project to build a report um, for our human resources team and for our managers, because we were spending a lot of time back and forth manually trying to find the status of, of each action. And in the, in the government in particular, you know, the hiring process is like 42 steps long. And so knowing where each, each action was and what step it was at and who was responsible for that step and how long that step had been, had been you know, in process is the perfect type of thing for Power BI to handle. And so I, I started working on that and quickly ran into a problem that I couldn't solve um, because it was dealing with previous value in the same column with repeated events. It was it was actually quite a quite a, a thorny problem, particularly for a beginning Power BI user. And so I went on the Microsoft community and I found a pattern, and I found a pattern that worked, or it. I thought it worked. I dropped it in my in my report, and it, it seemed to work. And um, the problem was I didn't understand it. And it really, you know, as I say, kind of the angel and devil on my shoulder here was, you know, it looks like it works. I don't understand what it's doing. It's forty lines long. Should I use it or not? And I ultimately decided not to. And I think. If there's kind of one thing I would I would say to take away from this is not to use code you don't understand just because it appears to work. And 
the interesting thing about um, that decision is the place I went next was Enterprise DNA to the the forum. And I looked on the forum and there wasn't, and I wasn't a member at this point, and looked on the forum, there wasn't a um, a pattern or solution that was exactly what I needed. So I joined and I I posted this question and Sam McKay, you know, got on the forum that day, sent me back a long response about how to do this. He and I went back and forth. That that whole um, thread is still up on the forum. I actually, this is, this right here is the actual code from that discussion. And, um, you know, it really led to, you know, it led to my involvement with enterprise DNA. So, you know, that, that DAX pattern decision is ultimately why I'm here today. And, I, you know, had I, had I taken the, the go ahead and use it, it works fine. It works fine. That might've worked out. Okay. But I probably would not be here today. And I, I definitely, of the mindset now that I never use code I don't understand. Um, so I want to talk about sources of of DAX patterns, and we can jump into into um, the web, and I can show you all of these. Um, maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll go through I'll go through this first, and then we can we can jump in. But basically, um, for those of you who are tabular editor or tabular editor three users. Um, C sharp scripting is a great source of of patterns. You can automatically create DAX measures and columns um, directly from your your data model. Um, Bernard Rossello um, is somebody who I I think is just doing absolutely phenomenal work in this area. And if you're um, if you're familiar with his um, Esprina blog. Um, it is, it is a great source for those C-sharp scripts. Um, in addition, um, Daniel Otik here, the developer of Tabular Editor 3, he, um, he has posted a whole um, repository of, of C-sharp scripts for DAX patterns. Um, SQL BI, this is, this is kind of, they were the ones who coined the term DAX patterns as far as I know. Um, and they've got a, a website and a book that's, you know, tremendous resource for, um, for DAX patterns. I say some very involved, complex patterns where they've got, they've got videos, they've got the ability to actually execute the code on the web. Another source is the Enterprise DNA Forum that um, Greg Phillips, one of our, one of our experts, one of the things he did relatively early in his tenure as an expert was built out a whole series of DAX patterns um, on the Enterprise DNA Forum. And the really nice thing about those is that um, he not only goes through the logic of those, but then cites the particular examples of forum questions that deal with that pattern. So you can see practical examples. It's almost like having a lab um, in, the, um, in the, the pattern section. Um, the Enterprise DNA, Enterprise DNA Analyst Hub, for those of you who are members, this is an incredible online resource for um, all sorts of development um, shortcuts. Um, and I'm going to show you there's there's DAX repositories, there's M code repositories, um, R, Python, so lots of code snippets, lots of patterns you can use here. Um, I mentioned DAX Cookbook, um, Power BI Quick Measures, and the Microsoft Quick Measures Gallery. Um, I'll jump in and I'll show those um, as well as Quick Measures Pro. We're going to do some, we're going to do some some work with that. That is a tool developed by Greg Deckler um, it, for Enterprise DNA, but he's also got a free version that he calls Microsoft Hates Greg's Quick Measures. Um, there's a fun story about that, that um, I've actually got an interview with him on on YouTube that talks about this, the, the whole genesis of that. Um, but this is this is really a, a kind of entire comprehensive engine for DAX patterns that you can use to incorporate 
all these other sources. And um, I will will definitely show you that. Um, there are some there are some issues in in looking at all of these these sources. Um, one of which is when we talk about quick measures, a lot of people say, well, I thought you shouldn't use quick measures. And there's a confusion sometimes between quick measures and implicit measures. And implicit measures in Power BI are just in the field list. If you click on, if you click on the field, it's got the ability to do sums or averages or mins or maxes right in the, the field list. And those are implicit measures. And my recommendation is to forget those ever exist and never use those. Um, I think there are all sorts of problems with that. One of which being that um, it's often not clear that those those measures are in play. Um, you can't you can't branch those measures. Um, there's a lot of limitations in that, and especially given some of the things we're going to talk about in terms of. Um, the C sharp scripting and automation. There's there's really no reason in my mind to use those. There's no there's no upside. I think like a lot of things that Microsoft has done to try to make things easy for beginners, it actually makes it worse for everybody. So I think the auto date table, the um, auto detect relationships, the implicit measures, those are all things that I I wish they'd never never even undertaken because. As in my experience, for both beginners and experienced users, they cause more problems than than they solve. Um, the next thing is parameterized versus non-parameterized quick measures. And what this is is in some of these in some of these instances, the the pattern is simply just text code. Um, and that's what I would call a non-parameterized quick measure. In other cases where you'll see the Power BI Quick Measures or Quick Measures Pro, um, those are, per, or the tabular letter scripts, those are what I call parameterized quick measures, which is the implementation is actually tied to your data model. And you're entering in the, the measures or columns that are going to be used in that quick measure. And that that is kind of a, a level up and um, I think in a lot of ways a a better a better solution than just the the non-parameterized quick measure because you can see the implementation and it understands the the data model that you've got. Um, or else what it'll do is it'll kick an error that will say, hey, the data model you've got is not compatible with this this quick measure. And then the last thing is kind of the where's the source of your of your quick measure or your pattern coming from. And, you know, in the buyer beware category, you know, the, the enterprise DA, DNA analyst hub is kind of an open community um, source for DAX patterns. And so anybody can contribute, um, you know, whereas if you look at like, you know, the SQL BI DAX patterns, that's Alberto and Marco. Those are the only, those are the only patterns in there, their patterns. And so, you know, in, in judging these, you know, you want to kind of think about what's the source of the pattern. And the, in the analyst hub, there very well may be some great patterns, but um, of people I don't know, but typically the ones I rely on are kind of those people that I know to be, to be reliable source. And so here's, here's kind of my, my, um, my hybrid approach to DAX patterns, you know, kind of looking at the the pros and the cons, and this is where the the chainsaw pants come in, which is, you know, when we we, we go back to, you know, the um, you know, kind of the the borrowing tools and think about, you know, this kind of scary tool. Um, even for me, you know, and I feel like I've I've got you know a pretty strong background in DAX, and you know, I'm pretty comfortable with some you know, fairly complex patterns. Um, but those borrowing complex DAX patterns scares me. And the way I, I kind of isolate myself from the downsides is to use those patterns only as a basis for learning that I never actually, I never actually will drop a pattern into, into my, my report without having gone through 
that learning first and basically building out my own version of that. And so that's, you know, kind of the, the chainsaw pants is, you know, even in the worst case where that pattern has edge conditions or, um, you know, unexpected effects that I'm basically walling that off and making sure is to the best of my ability that I'm using that just as a starting point and then building out a solution that, and I, this is not to say that my DAX experience or, you know, expertise is greater than, you know, some of the people who are providing those patterns, but what it, what it does for me is it, it ensures that everything that I'm using as a pattern is something that I feel I fully understand. And, you know, that's where, that's, that's where the, the safety in this comes in for me. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, Greg and I fully, you know, are in lockstep on, and, you know, this was the, the basis of the full basis of my presentation at the Enterprise DNA Summit this week is not to use any of the TI, the CAN TI functions that I, I have basically abandoned those completely um, and use only offset based measures because those functions to me are a, a black box. And we'll see, we'll see some examples of that. Um, so, you know, in terms of building out patterns, you know, any pattern that that starts with a um, a can TI function is one that um, I'm going to consider a very dangerous chainsaw. And so I'm going to build out a solution that takes the concept from that, but then implements it without the TI function. Then the next thing I do is once I've got my pattern built out, um, I templatize and automate that for future use. And I'll show you the ways in which, which I do that. And I say comparable to self-blood donation. So what, what I mean by that is the real benefit to me of, of DAX patterns is particularly for situations that you don't come across every day the ability to go to a, a repository and say, okay, if I've got a customer churn situation, instead of having to go back and rebuild that each time, I can take that pattern, but take the pattern that, you know, six months ago I worked through and, you know, was confident that I understood the code, the assumptions, the implications, the edge conditions, automated and templatized that, set it aside. And now when I use it, I feel it's it's safe for, for my use. And then what I will do is also share that out to the community, not with the expectation that somebody is going to be using that themselves directly, but that, that that then becomes their number one. You know, that that becomes a good starting point for them to say, okay, how do I how do I modify this and incorporate this into my own learning for um for my own patterns. And so that's that's the the general concept and here you know here is is kind of the the cycle which is um which is you start with the dax problem you kind of leverage the community knowledge you develop the pattern templatize and automate it share that back to the community and then that that cycle continues. So at this point, what I want to do is first see if there are any questions or discussion points. Um, and then I want to jump into Power BI and really, really dig into these, these concepts in depth. Uh, actually, Brian, there were some comments. I hope you have uh, also uh, read that, uh, those comments, but uh, I don't see any question up to now. So you may go on. Okay. Okay. So the first um oh let me before we uh before we jump into Power BI, let me just show you um let me just show you um a lot of these these different sources directly. Um so the first one is the the SQL BI DAX patterns. And this is I say this this is a phenomenal resource and um, I've got the, you know, because I'm a book guy, I like hard copy books. I've got the book for this, but really almost everything um, 
in the book is up on the website. And the website also includes, you know, videos and some interactive elements that obviously aren't part of the book. So, you know, unless you're you're kind of a, a habitual book person, you know, this this website just gets kind of gives you really everything you need. Um, and so it's got it's got a whole slew of, you know, a lot of time intelligence patterns. Um, as I say, I I have I have some real heartburn with using with using those, but um, if that's something you're comfortable with, they've got you know tremendous amount of information on that. Um, you know, if you go in here in depth into you know, each of the patterns, it'll talk about the um, the data model. It'll talk about the the theory behind it. Um, it'll then go into you know the the measures themselves and the ability to um, to copy that code to uh, to run it online. Um, so amazing resource here. Um, similarly, in the um, in the Enterprise DNA Forum, um, if you go to categories, and this is whether you're an Enterprise DNA subscriber or not, this is available to everybody that. Only subscribers can post, but everybody can view um, the um, the forum. And if we go to DAX patterns here, this is the um, this is the resource that Greg Phillips has developed. And so, if you go to previous value, um, and then up to the top, what he's got is basically, you know, kind of. The, Oh, give a hint of what the what the TI functions are. Absolutely. Um, so my favorite source for that is the SQL BI DAX guide. And if we look here, um, one of the things I like so much about this is it groups the DAX functions by by type. And so if we look down here to time intelligence. I think there are 38 time intelligence functions now. And um, these are these are all the, the CAN time intelligence functions. And there's a really interesting, um, I think we're I think we're doing okay on time. So let me just show you something that you may find really helpful in in your in your DAX journey, which is um, it's a, a report that Gustav Dudek and I put together. Um, and I've got it on the Novi Pro site. So um, it's called the most important DAX functions applying the Pareto principle. And, and basically what we did here is with kind of with the, the idea that the Pareto principle really applies to DAX in that our feeling is about 20% of the, of the functions in DAX provide about 80% or more of the value. And so what, what we did is um, this started off between a, a conversation that I had with um, Greg Deckler and we, we kind of categorized functions um, into kind of, you know, necessary, nice to have or unnecessary. And, um, and then I expanded this out to, the, to Sam Mackay and, and the others on the Enterprise DNA Expert team. And we voted as to which of the, the DAX functions were really critical and which were not. And so, you know, going to this, this 20% Pareto um, principle, there are 361 DAX functions and the results of the voting were, which were independent were really, um, really consistent in the sense that 58% of the DAX functions received no votes as being in the top tier of importance from any of the panelists. And functions that received zero, one, or two votes were 80% of the, of the total DAX functions. And the interesting thing here is if you look at time intelligence, there's only one function date add, which showed up as being within that, that expert panel one that they considered in that top 70. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that, but I think this, this report in general, um, which is available to everybody, um, is really, I think, interesting in terms of where to focus your efforts. And so 
you know these you know these these red functions up here or these are the the primary these are the yellow are kind of the the next tier to you know to worry about and then the the blue are but for you know very specific use cases um ones that you can you can largely ignore with very little impact so uh, i hope that answers the the question um going back to the um the enterprise dna forum so greg you know talks about like you know methods for previous row you know multiple different methods for previous row goes through kind of not just the the pattern but really the logic and and assumptions and basis for the pattern um and then has related content you know videos forum posts um you know all sorts of resources that get to how to use that pattern how to apply it properly <clears throat> so i think this is a great um great resource it's then got questions from you know members about that pattern um the next one i want to show you is the the microsoft quick measures gallery and um this is this is another great resource and um you can you know look here um you know chelsea Iden's duration this is kind of a famous one that chelsea Iden was um i believe an intern with with microsoft who came up with this this dax pattern for determining duration between time events and so you know the the code is here there's there's um, additional notation and um, examples on this so another great resource for for patterns um this is this is the analyst hub and um it's got a whole series of applications that we've we've built into this we're going to be doing some really major upgrade of this to incorporate it into our new platform but what we've got here is all sorts of of code repositories and so if you go um if you go to um to documents here you'll see like these are my these are my saved documents and so i've got I've got DAX, um, DAX patterns that I've saved that that I find useful and that I've worked through, and um, you know these are now ones that I'm that I'm confident in. And so what you, what I can do is just take copy that code and then paste that right into my in my reports. Um, what you can also do is um, you can go to the community section and you can share out your patterns um and so what we've got here is you know almost 400 dax patterns and you know as i say it's a little bit of a buyer beware situation you don't know um you know what people have done in terms of the um the review and um you know screening of these um of these quick measures but um there's a lot here and they do serve as a really good starting point. Um, and so you can you can click into any one of these. Here's one from Johanna. Um, and then all you need to do is you just say, you say copy code, you go into your own documents, new document and just paste code and there you go. Um, so another, another great resource there. Um, if we go into, into Power BI, um, and we go to the the field list. What you'll see is you'll see here the ability to it says new quick measure, and this is one I don't I don't ever use myself. Um, but these are these are parameterized quick measures. You can pick these. You can then enter, you know, enter your your parameter inputs. Click OK, and that will then create a a measure for you. Um, as a not something I use, but good to know it's there. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the um, you know the DAX cookbook um, being in my mind a, a very good source of of patterns. It's a different it's a different mentality in that um, which if you um, if you saw Greg's presentation last night. Um, about 
kind of his countercultural views on DAX. Um, it has a very different view about not using Calculate and not, a, not enough time to go into that here, but um, an interesting, interesting concept. So those are, those are the main places that I get my DAX patterns from. I think they've got some great, um, you know, great foundations for building your own patterns. The first thing I want to show you is um, as we really dive into, into, you know, now using DAX patterns is the, the C-sharp scripting. And one of the things I really love about this is, um, I'm going to move my Zoom window here. Um, here we go. Is, um, let's fire up tabular editor. And the thing I love about this is the speed and ease of creating multiple measures at once. And so one of the things you can do here is, um, oh, let me, before we, before we, we do this, let me, uh, let me real quickly create a new, um, a new measures table. And let's call that um, core measures because we're going we're gonna to create a lot of measures at once and I want to have a place to put them. Okay, so now if we go and we fire up tabular editor three and you can, you can do this in, the, in the, the, the free version of tabular editor as well, but I'm a big, a big fan of the work that Daniel's done on, on three here. Um, so if we go to our sales table and we open that up, what we can do is on our sales column, our quantity column, and let's say our profit column, we can, we can highlight those, go to macros, and then create bulk measures. And you'll see right away what it's done is it's created six measures for each for each column. You know, averages, max, median, min, um, and sum. So we can take all these measures now, highlight these, move these to our core measures measure table. And now hit control S and that'll save that back to the data model in our, in our report. And if we look here and we use, you often have to do just a, a quick refresh. Boom, 18 measures created right here. And, you know, kind of the simplest of DAX patterns, but there are, um, there are also ways in which you can, you know, through the C sharp scripting, you can create, you know, much more, much more powerful um, and complex measures automatically. And um, Bernard, as I mentioned, he is he is a master of calculation groups, and so he's got some scripts and patterns for automatically creating calculation groups. So tremendous power in in this to really build out your your DAX patterns quickly. But what I want to do is I want to show you on this one um, a really simple, a really simple um, pattern that I I pulled off of, and this was this was out of the analyst hub. Um, total sales year to date. Um, I'm just looking into questions, Anthony. Uh, yeah, careful about DAX code pulled out of form responses, definitely. I mean, I think that just holds true, you know, for really any source, but um, yeah, absolutely, you know, form responses. Um, so this total sales year to date, um, you look at this pattern and it doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you much. Um, you know, what, what exactly is this doing? Well, what it's doing is it's creating a a resetting cumulative total. And so if we if we take this this year to date in here, um, 
it's creating that that reset and cumulus total. And we can look at that and we can say, okay, that you know that looks looks right and um, you know maybe um, you know we've done some some validation. We know that 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 looks right. And so at that point, we could say, okay, that's a that's a useful usable pattern. But the thing the thing that is concerning here is going out to the edge condition. And so if we let's say we we simulate adding in current year data, and let's let's go to this filter and let's let's add in the 2022 data. And now we we start to see something that looks a little concerning here, which is total sales for for 2022 is um, 557,000, but year to date sales is also 557,000. And we happen to know in this data set that this goes out to the end of the year. And so, um, So basically, what we would, what I would think in terms of a year-to-date function is that that would only go through the current date, but in fact, that year-to-date function goes out cumulatively through the end of December, and that is that is an edge condition that if you're you're not aware of can really cause you some problems. And so um, here we've got. We've got what I did is the the version that doesn't use the can function, and you know it was kind of built out using that that pattern as a starting point. And then if we drop that in, what we'll see is this this handles um, oh. Yeah, if I take the, this was just a debug that I was doing here. Yeah, the, what you'll see here is um, that all of a sudden the the previous value um, changes significantly from the previous value in the can function. And that's a good example of an edge condition that you need to be aware of, and that is not going to be immediately apparent from just looking at the the function or even dropping it in until you explore kind of out to the boundaries of the data. And one of the things I want to show in this is there's an, as I as I mentioned in when we were talking um, before the the session started, there's a, a brand new kind of hot off the press. Um, blog entry from Jeffrey Wang, who is kind of the father of DAX. And he talked about in the, the August um, release of Power BI, there is a new function, undo totally, totally undocumented. It's not, it's not been even really acknowledged by Microsoft in the, the sense that he said, it's not quite ready for prime time. It's still got some bugs in it. It's still got some things to work out, but this is actually something to kind of keep on your radar screen. This is this is amazing. Um, and this is really the, I think, the thing we've been looking for for years in terms of the ability to kind of get those X-ray vision goggles into what DAX is actually doing behind the scenes. I want to show you briefly how that works. Um, so what what I've got here is the version of the offset measure. And the only difference is it has this evaluate and log command for both the total sales measure and for the virtual table. Um, and let's take this, take that comment out. Um, and what this, what this will do is this kind of operates behind the scenes. And if you, if you look at it in context, it doesn't show anything different. So it's it's exactly the same as the measure without the, the evaluate and log. But what he's done is he's 
he's built an external tool. And this is, this just blew my mind when I saw it. So what you do is you, you go to connect. And then you go to select events. And you want to make sure that the DAX evaluation log is checked. And then what you have to do is often go here and kind of activate the, um, the measure. And so what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to take it out of the table and we're going to put it back in. while the, uh, the external tool is running. And let's take a look at that. Let's hit the check mark and close that out. And now when we go back to here, uh, this is the problem with live demos. It always, something always happens that's not exactly what you think it's going to. So let's, let me just try to get this. It sounds kind of getting it jump started into into appearing in the table. It takes a little bit of a little bit of doing, but it's worth it. Let's try reconnecting that. Sorry, I'll just give this one more go and then we can move on. But um, Okay, that's not that's not doing what it's it's supposed to do, which is disappointing. But um, we can come back to it. Let me just give it one more kickstart. And this is using undocumented features in live live demos is always a little bit a little bit dicey. Okay, well let's move on and and come back to that. But this is definitely something to keep your eye on. That. Um, I think this is going to be a really important feature of DAX uh, moving forward. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, granularity. And if we go here into um, our total sets, here's another here's another real simple pattern that I pulled down, um, which is just the ability to move back a year and extract the, the previous value in an easy way. And what we can do here is just drop this measure in and take a look. And it seems to be, it seems to be pulling the, the previous value in. And let me zoom this in a little bit. That may make it easier to see. Pulling the previous value in exactly the right way. And so let's now take and drop that in um, again, to our second table, which is a fiscal year table. And that starts out okay, but then it, it goes really off the rails. And the reason is, is that it's, it's a granularity issue in that the, the data add function and generally the time intelligence functions, the CAN functions, cannot handle um, anything other than a standard Gregorian calendar. And so when you start to, when you start to deviate from that in terms of a fiscal year calendar or a 445 calendar or, um, you know, an ISO week calendar, um, those, those functions are going to go off the rails. And 
if I had the um, the evaluate and log working properly, that's another thing we could go and explore kind of when and where those are those are going off off track. But it really gets again to the point that this is, you know, when you look at when you look at this, this is a pretty simple. Whoop, um, That's a pretty simple. That's a pretty simple pattern, and so you you expect it would be, you know, fairly safe to use. But again, you get into these edge conditions, you get into the granularity shifts, and you can run into some real problems. So what I wanted to show was I wanted to show kind of for the last thing, is um, a tool that I I think is is amazing, and it, it's it's got a, it's got a little bit of a learning curve to it, and um, this is one that that. Greg Deckler is designed for um, enterprise DNA specifically, but he's also got that free version. And what it is, if we go into external tools, it's called Quick Measure Pro. And there's, there's a lot here and a lot you can do with this. And what this is, is basically, it's, it's really two things at once. It's both an existing archive of parameterized quick measures. And he's got I think almost every quick measure that's in the, the Microsoft gallery um, parameterized and included here, along with a bunch of others that, um, that he's put in custom for this program. And let me just grab a drink here. And I wanna show you how you can use this um, as a, again, a, a great starting point for, um, existing measures and also for um, storing your custom, your, your quick measures and, and DAX patterns that you've actually been through and done the quality control on. And you can store these. And what you can do is you can carry, because this sits in an external tool, it automatically carries forward over any of your reports that you don't have to, you don't have to basically go back and pull anything new in in each report that you do that these these measures basically carry carry completely over into in every report you you create now I'm not saying the measures are in your measures table but the ability to put them in is there and let me show you let me show you how this works in a couple of cases one of the things i really really like here is um He's got one of the things that, that's quite hard to do is these SVG measures. And so um, if you look at the raw code for these, these are these are intense. You know, the, the, these are SVGs are hard to deal with, and there's a lot that goes into them. Um, but let me show you, there's one that I gotta find called it's Stephen Few. Um And one thing that we haven't done yet in this is, oh, here we go, Stephen Few Red Dot, is put a search feature in. So you, you kind of have to scan up and down. But let me show you this one in the sense that what you can do with this now is you can set, and let's say we want to set this on our sales. And we'll pick OK. And then we want to have a target value of 500,000. And again, this is this is kind of what I mean by the parameterized quick measure. So we go to DAX here and let's just call this um, let's call this measure uh, sales red dot. And we can do here, one of the nice things about this program is it lets you put a description in. Um, it lets you pick which table you want to you put this in. So let's put this into our examples three quick measures table. Um, and then what you can also do, which is great, is you can set the, the data category right within the, the measure development. So you don't have to go back out and set that at the top of your, um, the top of your bar. So this is going to be an image URL. 
and we'll say create. And it said successfully created in example three quick measures. And if we go into our example three quick measures, Uh, what we have to do sometimes is um, just do a refresh. There we go, sales red dot. And now what, if you remember, what we said is we had the target. And so, oh, come on. Oh, I know why. Um, because I use total sales here when the measure is um, in our in our uh, core measures. It was sum of sales. Oh, come on. All right, hang on, let's just real quick, let's run back. Sorry, live demo gremlins. Let's try this one more time. Let me try blinking dot, flag the column, choose sum of sales. And those look good. Let's go to DAX. Dot. Put that into our example quick measures. Create. And let's run back here. Oh wait, this, this is the old one. Sales right down. Quick refresh. All right, blinking dot. And then we can change that to There we go. And now what we can do is we can create a, another real simple measure here, which is, and this is what I was originally gonna show with the, the Stephen Few, which mm -hmm. is a measure that says warning. If, sum of sales is less than 500,000, then we'll do 
sales blinking dot, otherwise blank. And let's take this, this blinking dot out and let's put our warning in. Set that equal to image. And there we go. So we can we can set the the row heights here, but that that then gives you you know quite a powerful way to do something that would normally take a tremendous amount of time in terms of building that SVG app. But let me show you another another one in terms of a, a quick custom that I've got. Um, so this is one I built just as in my own DAX pattern, which if we go up here to in this custom section, um, top ranking patterns. And so what I've got is, um, let's do a measure here and let's say we wanna take our top customers and let's say we want to, um, wanna take our top 10 based on the sum of sales. And let's just look at our DAX here. Let's do sales top 10 rank. Okay, we created that in sales. We could have just moved that over to our, our measure here, but sorry, I just moved my Zoom window out of the way. and go refresh. Oh, all right. So what I did here is I actually just picked the, I picked the, the sales column instead of the, the sum of sales measure. If I just do a quick replace on this. And now we can take and create a bar chart, drop this in. And we've got a quick, quick visual of our top 10, top 10 customers based on total sales. And so kind of a, a quick way to show kind of how we can use this to develop that, that archive of our, of our tested quick measures. Um, something that I really, really like, um, I think is, is extremely useful in terms of kind of cataloging those those quick measures that we, we have tested, um, keeping them in a, in a place that is extensible over, over any, um, any report. Let me just real quick jump back and see if the DAX, ah, here we go, it has triggered. Okay, so this is the, this is the, um, the tracking table. And if we go here and now select events and take out everything except for 
the errors and the evaluation log. Sort by subclass. Okay, this is showing the query, but it's not showing me the tables. Okay, so let's just give this one more go. And if, if it doesn't prove out, we'll, we'll call it a day. Okay, it's not showing the it's not showing the, the debug table, which is what I what I'd hoped it would. Okay, well that is at this point we're coming up on the on the time. That is is very much kind of what I wanted to cover today. Um, I hope that's been I hope that's been helpful to you in terms of providing some some useful food for thought. Um, let me try to stop sharing. Thank you. Um, it's not responding. Or can you can you see or hear me? Uh, yes, I see you and I hear you. Actually, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I don't see you. It's a dark, dark screen. But okay, for I some reason, well. Zoom has Zoom has frozen up on me in terms of the the, the ability to stop share. But um, yeah, at this point, I really again, I really um, really thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, Sorry for a couple of glitches. That's always, always a little bit of the danger of, of real time, uh, real time demo. But I hope that that um, that has given you some, as they some interesting food for thought, um, some pros and cons of DAX patterns, some good places to find where you can use those DAX patterns to start with, and a way to a way to kind of apply those. Um, to kind of squeeze the the maximum benefit out, but at the same time, kind of minimize the risks inherent in in the use of those patterns. So, at that point, I think I'll um, I'll stop. I'll see me. I'm sorry. Zoom is giving me a not responding error. Uh, so um, let me try to stop sharing. Um, yeah. Okay, just a minute. First of all, I'm I'm just going to stop uh, streaming on uh, Facebook.